And our next speaker, Anton Emmanuel, also from London, will tell us all about what's missing in the London classification. I guess that's going to be a very interesting talk. Uh, many thanks, Mark, and many thanks to the organising committee. I'm uh, delighted to uh, talk about the what's missing part of the London classification. And I have this sense that sometimes when you look at this, it's there's a temptation to sometimes think, oh, God, why are we looking at this stuff? So much detail. It's just beginning. What are we trying to find? What's the silver needle in the haystack here? And I think for me, fundamentally, I come to this as a clinician. Um, and what does the clinician want from this rather than necessarily the academic perspective that we sometimes take? So... Fundamentally, any testing has to be of value when it informs what we do next, whether that means further further investigation or whether it moves moving into treatment. Testing needs to essentially make sense of the history. Uh, a test which is completely contradictory to the history can be useful. If it's completely supportive, it can be useful. When it provides additional information in a different way, that's useful. What's not helpful is uh, a test where you measure X and this history is of Y and the two things are not in any way overlapping. Um, testing fundamentally for anything to be useful has to be reproducible. It's no point having a measure which says one thing one day and another the other day. And it's one of the things that's absolutely bedeviled much of physiology. And it needs to have a sort of a value to the systems that run it. And I think when one asks questions like this, there's a danger of being, in sort of the words of Billy Connolly, the kind of the fart in the, in the space suit or a more genteel expression from Tolstoy, this idea of being like a dog in a skittle lane. I think we have to be prepared to be somewhat disruptive uh, to make some progress with this. And I hope I can be constructively um, uh, used, used in this space. Because uh, ultimately what we're after with all this stuff is to essentially make it a better assessment for patients and one which is more useful to clinicians and patients jointly. Um, so currently, as you've heard already, the, there's a kind of very overall high level focus of the classification as it stands in this first iteration, namely to look at, from my perspective, aspects of uh, anal tone and contractility, uh, disorders of uh, some of the reflex coordination um, of sphincter function, and then some of the aspects of sensation. And broadly speaking, as a, as some of you will know, my background is as a neurologist, uh, I would see this as a sort of mixture of motor, sensory, and reflex function we're test, uh, assessing thus far. And this brings us to one of the fundamental first things. How do we classify abnormality? Well, from a gastro point of view, we're all familiar with the idea of classification in kind of the staging system of uh, polyps and cancers. And we know that this is a uh, useful uh, to come to the first four points I made about utility of any testing. This is useful because it gives us an idea of prognosis for the future and management in the interim. So that's a very useful staging and it goes up in a nice linear stepwise fashion. By contrast, in the neurology world, everyone's familiar with the MRC assessment of power in upper and lower limbs. And this is a completely non-linear scale. At grade five, we had full power, completely normal function that you could, you know, win an Olympic medal with. And then you go down from being able to um, to move your joint against some resistance, then to moving against gravity. And then you suddenly take a kind of a steep drive if you can only uh, move down with visible contraction, but no actual movement of the joint and then down to no contraction at all. So this is a non-linear scale. Again, we've learned how to use this, but we have to learn that when we classify abnormality, we're not necessarily going through a nice linear step-by-step -step thing. And of course, when we look at things like a physiological measure, we have all the question of, is this normally distributed? Um, and so we've ended up with this notion of trying to create a kind of a, 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 a kind of spectrum of abnormality. And forgive me for using a, a color spectrum and you may get confusing with high resolution, but it's not intended to be that. But to illustrate the idea of a, the fact that physiology is distributed along a normal continuum. And so at one extreme, we have things which we can classify as being major, where there's a very clear deviation from the norm. Minor, where it's in that kind of hinterland of the standard deviations. Normal, where it fits into the uh, that kind of bell-shaped distribution. And then somehow outside of all of that kind of categorization where there's inconclusive things where there is either variability uh, between patients or even within patients or between observers. And then there's the whole thing of, does this make sense in terms of what the patient's presenting with? Somebody's got this symptom of obstruction, but the features show something completely contrary, but which is not within the normal range. So I think we have to sort of put that into this, that when we come to classifying abnormality, there are a variety of ways of doing it. And the one we're looking at physiologically is 
this slightly um, uh, matrix one, which doesn't necessarily give us the nice simplistic uh, way of viewing things like the uh, cancer or uh, power relations I gave as examples to contrast. Those of you who've had the misfortune of hearing me before know that I often talk about bowel emptying as being a very very simple thing and the analogy I use most often probably is the one I'm getting toothpaste from a tube uh, but that underneath that rather simple exercise of you know taking the lid off squeezing the tube putting the lid back on and um, there's a whole set of uh, reflexes at spinal level at um dorsal horn level at um at sort of uh, cortical level and indeed at sphincter and pelvic floor level all of which needs to coordinate uh, at socially appropriate times and at appropriate speeds so this is a complex thing for us to understand physiologically and um the question of course then comes can this be measured number one in a laboratory given the complexity of the emotional part of uh, bowel function and how easy is it to simulate uh, the private act of bowel emptying in a laboratory and given how we do testing generally can be done lying down and if we move to doing it sitting up can we do it in a way which is uh, reproducible physiologically so one of the things classification has done is to try and define the patient groups we study and i've put these into sort of three separate chunks as you can see the ones whom i think there's least controversy uh, patients with incontinence patients with uh, post uh, obstetric injury uh, and patients who are under planning to plan to have surgery uh, fistula surgery or reconnection after being defunctioned all of that makes sense for obvious reasons which go um, which don't need to be elaborated on in this talk there is something more of a question mark among some of us amongst the utility and difficulty evacuation but i fundamentally believe that whereas conventional manometry has no real assistance from that based on all the literature there may be a place for um, using um, um, high resolution manometry to study these patients um, and i think the question about anorectal pain is still for me one which is much more um, unestablished uh, and i would put that as something which is the least um the least clear and most contentious of the patient groups for us to study in this way um in a in a routine sense i think as a research project go for it um now again you're familiar with the rao classification of uh this and i don't want to dwell on this other than to point out these various forms of dyssynergia but if we look at what's missing in terms of the manometry um uh, data to date and remember that we are in an early phase of this as i'm sure you've seen so many times we have this notion one thing is that um, that original description said is that um, if you look at these different forms of dyssynergia there's a high reproducibility of this so from that initial presentation it seemed like this is a useful measure because in individuals there's a very good rate 95 percent plus for each of the types of dyssynergia so that that's promising um but when you look at it uh this is some data from john gosling uh who did a so study in 80, 80 patients who went through six reiterations of uh, conventional or high resolution manometry uh, and looked at the um look at various forms of re repeatability uh, to see this you can see that actually the um the repeatability for conventional and high resolution manometry is pretty much the same and depending on whether you're a glass half full or glass half empty person you would say that well conventional manometry is not very reproducible we know from a variety of studies from korea and france and um and the uk um and so if high resolution manometry isn't offering as much more than that is that really reproducible but i think this is again another question which will, is warranted and certainly once you have something like the classification it allows colleagues to start producing these papers and i'd encourage editors not to underprint these or under report these because they are repetitive they actually are a key part of getting a technique established what the classification has done though is to um is to have a uh, light thrown on it much more carefully by high resolution manometry and again this is data from john's uh, paper but essentially it shows that actually if you look at some of this stuff the reproducibility is one thing but actually the overlap with normality so that whole thing about inconclusivity that i showed in that earlier slide um is that a huge number of of controls would have one father form of synergia so healthy individuals um of whom almost a nine out of ten have some form of dyssynergia by classification so we need to bottom out what that inconclusivity is we can't leave that blue zone as i showed in that earlier slide as wide as it is now that must be narrowed for it to be useful one of the things that the classification doesn't do and i said just a list in sort of sequence it doesn't uh, 
provide clarification of the type of procedure done. I'm not talking about the equipment used, I'm talking about the, uh, the procedural parts. And specifically, should we be uh, clearing the, enema, uh, the bowel out with an enema, a water enema, a chemical enema, a spontaneous bowel action? If so, how long before? And I put this slide here from the data by Adil Bajwa, suggesting that actually it makes a difference to physiological measures. This is data showing that in uh, using a barostat measure with um, isobaric um, uh, distension of the of the rectum with increasing volumes, you can see that there's a change in parameters of resting pressure, uh, significant um, um, from baseline. Uh, compared uh, for both, sorry, for both resting and for squeeze. In other words, the more volume there is in the rectum, the less cleared it is to make the, the story complete about this uh, procedural part, uh, the more it influences um, emptying. And so could we be getting uh, non-reproducible, non clinically physiological meaning data um, because of that. So it's something which I think we need to think about and I'm sure studies will be done in that regard. So all I say here is uh, it's around trying to point to things that need consideration. There's another part about the instructional part that's given around procedures and uh, this is done very clearly. One of the great things about classification, it tries to give a script almost, but this is again data from John's uh, work uh, looking at increases in the vertical axis on anal pressure versus increases in rectal pressure back to that synergia route type classification and looking at the situation when the patients were studied with the observer with no observers in the room the patients in a seated position on a commode with no one in the room in random order um, and or with the observer in the room and what you see is that there's a significant influence of being observed so in other words being watched by well-meaning clinicians strangers essentially alters your physiological profile so back to that thing about what does inconclusive mean what does physiological mean in this setting so again questions to be answered what are the opportunities going forward with this? What are the things that we can do better? We can certainly do better to understand some of the physiology. Again, as a neuro, neuro person by background, I'm slightly obsessed by the fact that if we can mimic what has been done for the bladder and understand the reflexes, specifically the fact that we have this huge number of uh, enteric neurons and how they connect even more so than bladder function. So what can we understand about rectal reflexes? And there's some old work now, um, again, uh, undertaken by colleagues in North America, showing talking about these rectal sensory motor reflex that we you distend in the rectum, you get a sphincter uh, reflex, which is initially a, as a lag period, followed by um, a spike, followed then by a duration of um, a motor response and sphincter. I've alluded already to Adil's work on um, the uh, guarding response, i.e. when you distend in the rectum, actually interestingly for both isovolumic and isobaric contractions you get this alteration of sphincter tone in other words as the rectum fills you get increased sphincter contractility uh, that's the external sphincter uh, and that's an interesting phenomenon as part of the guarding response which we see in the bladder so can we use um, high resolution manometry and manometry to understand that better that would be really interesting would that pick out a group of patients uh, with incontinence who currently have normal numbers but where something like looking at these reflexes may give us something more subtle about this um, sensory testing, this is a figure on the left uh, lifted from the from the classification paper and uh, on the right hand side a very recent paper again from uh, contributors to this um, to this symposium uh, looking at the uh, the various thresholds, uh, one, two or three thresholds that we can measure and correlating that with symptoms and the point I'm trying to move to is the way one of the things that the physiological testing can help us with if we think about what's missing and where we go to because what's missing as i keep saying only matters if we think about where that helps us go to in terms of being constructive we can move towards this idea i think of phenotyping functional symptoms this is certainly a big part of the work we're doing with ms and um and spinal injury in terms of understanding bowel function this is just a completely artificial plot i've put on here but essentially to try and think of this in this kind of uh, three-dimensional way where we have for example in this axis here the aspects of motor physiology that we can look at in this imaginary axis the aspects of sensation um, and this axis something about symptoms whether that's done by questionnaires or psycho psychometrics or combinations of that and then we can and put patients into these kind of 3D clusters, identify particular phenotypes, which may, these patients all have the same symptom, but they may then actually require different consideration of whereabouts they fit in this cluster. And that's fundamentally one of the things that is potentially important about this. And when I say missing, it's missing for a good reason, because it's the thing that's opened the door, HRAM potentially to be able to do this. It may not pan out, but that's why we should think about this as being a tool for future investigation. 
again, to refer some of John's PhD work, Gosling's PhD work, um, you know, we could use this to also look at some of the uh, specific things. So beyond that kind of phenotyping, we can also look at very specific things. The puberic tardis has been this elusive thing here. John's done some nice work in 80 odd uh, subjects looking at how we can look at this peak here as puberic tardis and how that differs in morphology from men to women. Um, uh, and that's really interesting. He's converted that using MATLAB into looking at 3D volumes. And you can imagine potentially the utility of this of thinking, oh, well, if I had a fistula patient, I could then look to see where this is. Interesting that this correlates that kind of vector morphology uh, to show um, the, the bulk of the male sphincter compared to the female sphincter. And potentially it's possible, maybe we could even imagine a day where we could look at this pre-obstetric to understand uh, people's risk uh, of subsequent injury. Um, what advantage does HRAM give us our other methodologies? I've almost finished now. Um, we can compare it with other things in terms of um, other forms, and specifically for patients with evacuation difficulty, which I said is one of the more contentious areas. And we can see that when it's been used as conventional monometry, there is variable levels, but generally poor agreement between conventional monometry um, and these other modalities of understanding patients with evacuation difficulty. So again, simple thing to do would be to try and improve upon these poor percentages with HRAM. Does it predict outcome with biofeedback? Again, this randomized controlled trial in fecal incontinence of Solomon, suggesting um, that actually if you compared ultrasound, manometry, and pelvic floor in these incontinent patients, there was literally very little difference in terms of the p-values, as you can see on the right column. Um, does it, this is a more recent um, uh, data review from colleagues in Manchester, Dipesh Vasant, uh, the first author, and the conclusion underlying down there. Um, that by contrast um, with um, the uh, gender and uh, tra um, training aspects, age, um, etc., but in particular the manometric features underlined in green uh, don't have any correlation with outcome. So, final slide the future what does this hold i think the future potentially holds interesting ideas if we can use this to understand physiology and actually think about what this gives us beyond what we currently have in terms of phenotyping patients better and looking at the bits of the system that we haven't currently got good a good handle on um the danger of course is that it can give us something which is sometimes stated and obvious uh, and in a more elaborate way um but i think the door is open for enthusiastic physiologists to do this better and i'm delighted to symposia like these are being run to try and make subsequent updates and classification better informed. Thank you very much indeed.